Welcome to Superheroes of Science. I'm Steven. And I'm Sarah. We co-host Science from the Experts. Our guests are professionals doing cutting-edge science right now. They are experts in their field discussing what they know best. So listen up and learn real science from real people. Subscribe now and stay informed of our latest episodes and show your support. Joining us today on Superheroes of Science, we are here with Robert Nowak, Professor of Geophysics at Purdue University in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences. So welcome. Hi. Well, very, very good to be here. These are really fun, and uh, we enjoy them. Hopefully, the students and the teachers do. No, I think so. I think yeah. this, be, this, is, this is a good topic. This yeah. is a good okay, topic. Great. So I think great. Uh, this will be a good presentation. I think people okay. will get a lot out of this. Absolutely. And, uh, We're talking about logarithms. Yeah. Well, we're originally talking about uh, Richter and his magnitude uh -huh. scale. Yes. And but sort of the subtitles are powers of ten, because magnitudes are a powers of ten scaling system, mm -hmm. and so it's many times one where it's a very convenient one in various parts of STEM to think about it in terms of again yeah. Richter's magnitude scale, and I also have sort of a sub. A title here of how babies count oh, because okay. as it turns <laughs> out people have found that babies like to count in logarithms or powers of 10 as well so uh, and now, we'll this, isn't a, this isn't a Sesame Street thing this is a babies counting prior to learning counting or? it is and it's before they go to school okay. and when they do these these pictures of whether baby can see you know one little object or two or four or eight they tend to go in progressions of powers and it's easier for them to think so they can tell four little animals or something or, or lambs or whatever versus eight versus seven and eight so the one two three four five six seven eight nine ten is a less natural counting system than you know powers of ten or powers of two or what have you and so we'll kind of talk about that at the end yes. after we talk about Richter and yes. his magnitudes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm excited to get back to that part. Yeah. Okay. So should should, should we should we move forward? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and this is that comment I was saying is that it's counting babies, not counting babies directly, but how babies count, mm -hmm. and seismologists too. So, and here's baby here, and there are four little plastic lamps in front. And the question is, when they check baby's brain, can they tell the difference between numbers of, in this case, little plastic lamps in front uh -huh. or not? So, again, we're going to go back and talk about seismology and, uh, uh, and, and Richter's magnitude scale. But we have to go back a little earlier than that in the sense that earthquakes have been around for a long time and it's been sort of a, a, a damages in, you know, in, in, in ancient China and Japan and in the Holy Land and people have long documented histories of those. And this was just an example I put on of an ancient myth in Japan that underneath the island are these large fish and they're buried in the mud under the Japan, and they're called namazu. And when they shake their tails, large earthquakes happen, and of course, yeah. damages to, yeah. to cities and towns, etc. And it basically was the role of the gods to keep these mischievous creatures in line and not create more huge earthquakes to mm. destroy cities. And I just kind of note on there of, of kind of like keeping your little brother in line of how the, 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 the gods were supposed to keep these kind of mischievous yes. animals at bay and quiet under the islands. But then the question is, what is an earthquake? And that, that's, that's somewhat of a, a, a confusing uh, term because it sort of comes from when earthquakes shook the ground and wasn't originally a connotation of what the source of the earthquake vibrations were. And now when we think of an earthquake, it's the earthquake source that okay. we're talking oh. about. So an earthquake is a source of vibrations of, of the ground beneath our feet. And the term nowadays is associated with catastrophic ruptures on falls from in the earth, such as the San Andreas Fault that many people have heard of. Mm -hmm. uh, and then seismic waves then spread out as vibrations 
away from the focus in the in the, the small picture there and those are the things that cause the vast majority of damage of earthquakes of course you could be unlucky and you have have your fault right on or your house right on the San Andreas fault but that's much more limited in extent so somewhat like you know hurricanes and stuff it's very massive damage and it's largely the seismic waves mm -hmm. that do it and in the early part of the 20th centuries people wanted to quantify the bigness of earthquakes. Yes. And this was tasked by this gentleman, uh, before Frank Berger. You, before you oh, switch, go ahead. Uh, let me ask a real question, a little bit of clarification on that. Right. Because it's whenever I hear of the term earthquake, right. you're defining that slightly differently than what I've heard in the past. Because uh, it's actually, because I've heard it you know, in my head, mm -hmm. when I think of earthquake, okay, it's the ground shaking is an earthquake. You said That's it used to be that way. It is. And but now, now they're kind of the connotation is the source of the vibrations, which is slip on an earthquake fault or something. Okay. And so that would be the 1906 earthquake. And it does shake the ground around. So it's kind of a, a misused term, I guess I'd have uh -huh. to say that. But as the term says, it's the quaking of the earth. Yes. And so mm -hmm. that nominally is the correct meaning, usage of the word, but it's now thought to be the, the source. And here in this picture, it's the focus. That would be called also the hypocenter yes. in the ground. Uh, and then the surface location is called the epicenter. So the hypocenter is where it happened, yes. the energy was the released. Slip, okay. There's a slip on a catastrophe at depth. Okay. Many earthquakes don't rupture the surface. They're just at depth. Oh, and yet okay. it will still cause vibrations and seismic waves. Okay. Out yeah, that makes right, sense. Right. Hmm. So in the case of the San Andreas Fault, it did. And you could actually, after the earthquake, go and map all the deformation, the breakage of the ground for like 200 miles along oh. the surface. You know, so um, anyway, so let me uh, move yeah. on here. And a seismograph is the, the device used to measure ground vibration amplitudes and correspondingly seismic waves uh, during an earthquake. And normally, of course, the seismograph is not located at the epicenter or what. It's some distance away, and, uh, but it will still record these vibrations. And so in, like if you're in Los Angeles, or, you know, if you're in Southern California, for example, there may be three or 400 of these seismographs nowadays. But in the time of Richter, there was only a handful. And he needed to use those quantitative measurements from seismographs to kind of figure out how to basically, you know, uh, uh, solve the question of how big was a given earthquake. Was it bigger than another one, smaller than another? Yeah. And he wanted to use a well-calibrated seismograph so to do that. Prior to that, it was... Well, they had prior to that something called a, a modified Mercalli scale, and it was basically a map on the surface of damage. And okay. then you went to this, the most damage, which was kind of the center of the episode, of the, mm -hmm. of the, the, uh, the, 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 the damage map. And there was like a no Roman numeral one through 10 degree of damage. And that was the earlier way before seismographs. But it was very subjective because it depended if there was a city there. If, it, yeah, was damage, was if it was in the middle of nowhere, how would you do? How would you make that assessment? Okay. Because is it yeah. mapping what they actually observe on the surface? Right, then? right. Okay. And Mercalli was a well-known uh, volcanologist, as it turns out, from Italy. And it's now sometimes called the modified Mercalli scale. But it's simply a damage map and how extensive was it. But in that sense, it depends on whether there is urban area around or what got damaged. Yes. And, and Richter wanted to make a more quantitative measure than that. And that's the seismograph that's right. able to provide so, those. Right. And so, for example, below is mm -hmm. called a seismogram. And this, if you look on the upper one, if the ground moves up and down and there's a mass on a, on a spring, mm -hmm. it kind of will bounce up and down. And if you can figure out some way to put it on some strip chart paper that goes around, you can actually map, up, map out a seismogram with time. And the lower picture is time on the horizontal and amplitude of ground vibration on the vertical on that. So that would again be sort of a measure. And what Richter wanted to do is take essentially the vertical peak uh, energy on the seismograph, uh, in his case in Southern California, and then make that as a measure of how big the earthquake was. And he was a fairly young scientist, wasn't he? He was. And he moved to Caltech, I believe, from astronomy. 
and uh, where they also had things where there were powers of ten scales, which is brightness of stars. So he was a little bit aware of that concept of powers of ten from his earlier head. And then he moved it to what's now called the Seismo Lab at Caltech, okay. which is you know the most preeminent earthquake seismology institute in the world today. Oh. Yeah, but this is back in 1920 yeah. that we're talking, you know. So, uh, so let me move forward here. And this is a picture of Richter. And, and again, I think this is a relatively nice picture of him. Mm -hmm. And they've got a seismogram on the background. And this is from Susan Huff, who's a USGS scientist, wrote a, a, a book about Richter called Richter Scale. And I actually like the idea for maybe young people as well to basically find some interesting scientists or whatnot and yeah. find out about their life. And I think this is what Susan did in this book. And it's, 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 a, it's, it's a very nice read talking about the various aspect of how a scientist develops and, and et cetera. Uh, and today, his name is associated with the magnitude scale. Although, in fact, a more senior seismologist at that time at Caltech was uh, uh, Beno Gutenberg. And, uh, and it was originally called the, the, uh, the Richter Gutenberg magnitude oh. scale, but his name got removed and Richter's name. His name is on many other things, but it's just how sometimes names get associated with concepts and, mm -hmm. and ideas, you know. So, uh, but anyway, he's, he's known nowadays uh, as sort of for finding how a, me a way to measure the size of an earthquake. How big was it? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and here's just sort of a, a kind of a conceptual. So earthquakes, meaning the source of the vibration of slip on a fault, generate seismic waves recorded on a, on a seismograph that, that typically decrease in amplitude and size with distance away from the epicenter. So in this on the water, you, you're, you're in your canoe or something, you throw a stick in the water or a rock in the water, and you'll see these vibrate, you know, these water waves emanating out. And they by and large decrease in size as the wave goes away from where you plunk yeah. the stone in the water. And this was a thing that, that Richter had to contend with because the seismograph isn't located right near the epicenter. It's some distance away. And so what he needed to do is kind of quantify how in a given region the seismic waves decay with distance. Okay. And you have to factor that in to yeah. say what the size of the earthquake was. Otherwise you've got another influencing effect. And so, uh, and so this is so, so he first needed to correct for this distance decay of the seismic amplitudes and vibrations. And what he did in Southern California is he took many earthquakes and derived a general decay curve with distance from the epicenter. And so then, once he had that, no matter where the seismograph was located in relation to the epicenter, he could factor out the decay part. And so then you could compare earthquakes of different sizes suddenly on those seismographs. And is earth materials not influence that? The well, they gave, do definitely. Okay. And in fact, this has been sort of a, a, a bit of a confusion in seismology in the, you know, the hundred years since then, because Richter wrote a book and he defined these decay curves for Southern California. And people then decided to use these in other parts of the world. Oh. And they forgot about the fact they needed to calibrate a decay curve <laughs> for their area. And this came on actually even where we sit now in the central United States, yes. because the decay of seismic waves is much less in the eastern, uh, midwestern United States than in California. And you could think about it that there's mountains in California. And they kind of break up the seismic waves. Mm -hmm. so, so a similar magnitude earthquake in California as in the Midwest, although we get fewer of them here, uh, the waves just don't go as far. So for example, the great 1811-1812 magnitude high seven or eight earthquakes, these are before seismographs, so they had to kind of figure out how they assigned a modern day magnitude to them, but they were felt as far away as Washington, D.C. And so the 1906 uh, San Andreas earthquake uh, did not have waves that went that far. Good. So and that's so you have to get our, the geology. You have to factor the geology. Allow it to travel right, and it's more plain layered here, and this is also older crust here compared to California. Oh, okay. so it's not just the mountains and the topography that are different, but it's also kind of the age and stability of the climate. It's it's flat lying here in the Midwest, but it's also flat lying in depth, and the waves just go farther. So to 
tell me how far off have I been when I've been teaching this to kids? Um, <laughs> I'm gonna have to apologize. <laughs> but because what I've told them in the past is, okay, here in the Midwest, we have a hard rock bedrock and it really travels because we're so compacted. But over like in California, as an example I use, uh, it's a lot of a sandier substrate which absorbs the energy more. Is that uh, am I off a little bit when I say it that way? The waves way? go deeper in the earth than that and it's sort okay. of younger crust. Uh, um, and sort of this older, colder, midwestern craton, okay. you know, and it is also more layered, and so you can kind of visualize it as sort of geometric, the waves would go further, mm -hmm. but it's actually, you know, an older crust as okay. well in the mid in the middle United States, wow. and uh, so we have less earthquakes never, here. Never, we have we have yeah. less earthquakes here, but in 1811, uh, it rang church bells in Washington D.C. Yeah, and this is a good long distance away from southern Missouri, you mm -hmm. know, when that happened. So, uh, so in any case, uh, this is just a picture of this. This is Princeton University has these numerical simulations of waves, and they put in a realistic earth inside. And this is done on big supercomputers nowadays. But every time a new earthquake happens, you can go to the Princeton University site, and they'll show simulations of waves emanating out to compare with the observed. Oh. And this is just an example of this, of some earthquake that I think is in Oklahoma or something, okay. as the waves emanate out. And they do decay with distance away, and that would factor in on these simulations as well. Okay. So, but in the yeah. earlier days when they did earthquake magnitude, well, in the, in the 1970s, they put out seismic graphs in the New Madrid area, St. Louis University did. And it turns out they calculated magnitudes, but they used the decay curves for Southern California, and they had to recalculate all the magnitudes later. So, so they would compare with the magnitude in a California earthquake or one in, you know, in, in Japan or something. Mm -hmm. so, so you have to get that out to get something related to the source. Okay. So, okay, the reference taken here, correct for local geology that allows seismic waves recorded by a well-calibrated seismograph at some distance, because you're taking that distance effect out, to then measure the size of the earthquake. Sorry. So you're measuring an out to output to say something about an input. Yes. And you have to take out those influencing factors in between. Right. And Richter, in kind of an input-output system, like a black box, he's getting an output of a black box, and he's trying to say something about the input. And, and the geology had, has to be corrected for it okay. to do that. And that is actually the, the most essential thing of the magnitude scale. But there is another factor, and that's that what Richter found is the vibrations doing many earthquakes. Uh, you and I could feel them, for example, but they may not be damaging to a building. But once you start getting to inches or even, heaven forbid, feet of vibrations of the ground oh. during a magnitude 8 earthquake mm -hmm. somewhere in the world, you know, buildings come down. And, and, uh, and certainly those would be great earthquakes. But you can also get much smaller earthquakes that could have fractions of an inch or, uh, or even thousandths of an inch or something like that, very tiny motions. And the seismographs are capable of measuring those distinctions. But the problem is you need to come up with a magnitude scale that allows for that degree of variability of ground vibration amplitudes. Mm -hmm. And so this comes back to his second major innovation, and that's to use a power of 10 scale. So this is where here I just put here the power rangers to this, the, the rescue for this second problem that Richter had to face in coming up with a, a size measure that's reasonable, like a number between 1 and 10, mm -hmm. for example, right? And so here's something I just got off the internet, and I'm sure <laughs> most kids today, this is probably long since gone, and I just wonder with the Power Rangers there, they're gonna, that guy in the back, they're gonna turn around and just start punching him or something. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, so this is just an example of powers of 10. Okay. And on the left is some numbers going from 1,000 to 100 to 10 to 1. And then you could go smaller, 1 tenth, 1 100, 1 1,000. And so when you write that in terms of powers of 10, the top one would have three as in that middle, and you can write that 10 with an exponent three on it. Uh, 100 would be two tens, that would be 10 with an exponent of two on the far right. Uh, 10 would just be one, and by convention in this scale, just the number one 
would be 10 with an exponent of 0. And if you go smaller than that, 1 tenth would be written in that terminology as 10 with an exponent of minus 1. 1 one hundred would be 10 to the minus 2, 1 1,000 to the 10 to the minus 3. So, so basically the way this works is how many powers of 10 make up the number is called the logarithm or the log of the number. And I don't know quite where this, this probably came from this guy Napier or something in, in England or something, where the actual term logarithm comes in. I'm sure there's teachers that could look that up and have their students look that up. But so for example, if I had a number that was 10,000, that would have 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. And so there's four tens in the number. And this would also be called the log of the number, would be okay. four. And Richter, in his magnitude scale, is his numbers of seismic gap varied so much that he was going to use that exponent as the measure of the magnitude. Oh. So, so this is like, you know, 1, 10, 100, 1,000. He would have that be uh, uh, 1, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3. And so you get a number between 1 and 10. And those, those like, if it was 10, it's 10 what? Well, ten, you, 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 the, the way it worked is he defined his reference curve. And in that reference decay curve, he counted that as a magnitude zero. Okay. And so if you have at a certain distance 10 times higher than the reference curve, it would be a magnitude of one. Okay. If it's 100 okay. times bigger than the reference curve, it'd be a magnitude of two. So the same earthquake, but it might be different magnitudes depending where you are. Well, no, the distance effect has been taken out. Okay. You need to know the epicenter first, and then okay. you calculate oh, the distance, and then, and then you do the decay. Okay. Yeah, okay. so you still need to know where it was, mm -hmm. and then your seismographs are in some distance away from where that epicenter okay. was, and the focus. So, and I, I just sort of comment on this, that, that at, here at Purdue, we do have a student newspaper here, yeah. and it's called The Exponent. But uh, as many of us who are local <laughs> to the Purdue University uh, community, you know, they have great sports features, but they're normal students. You know, the, 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 the news stories are all just taken from the yes. internet, et cetera. And, but it's mostly an advertising thing on the daily. You get it if you're going to McDonald's to read the newspaper, right? And, <laughs> but, but instead of being called the, the exponent, sometimes people just call it the log because it's like, you know, how many Z's to put you to sleep <laughs> when you're watching it. So, but it's kind of a funny term. I mean, if I look on the far right numbers, you have 10 to the 3 for 1,000. 3 is the exponent, but if I took 1,000 on your hand calculator and just did log, it would have 3. Okay, so it's kind of a flip in that way. So, so it is still a powers of 10 scale. And that's why I say power, power rangers to the rescue because Richter wanted a scale that went from 1 to 10. Mm -hmm. He didn't want a number that went from 1 to 10,000. You know, it right. didn't help. So, oops. And so again, so the range of numbers can be really large. Richter used a powers of 10 scale for his magnitude scale, where an increase of one magnitude unit would be 10 times larger in vibration. And he, by convention, started as his reference curve with magnitude zero, okay. kind of the smallest mm -hmm. at the time. Yes. Now, of course, you can get smaller ones than the reference curve, like with fracking and things like that, which oh. are very tiny. And those have negative magnitudes oh. because okay. they're, they're one-tenth of what the reference curve is, or one one hundred. It's so small, it's a negative one. Yeah, wow. right, right. And typical fracking events in Oklahoma, for example, typically would have magnitudes of you know negative but some can be quite big, and that this has been concern in that part of the central United States. Hmm. So kind of fracking events getting out of control, you know, yeah. and, and eliciting a, a bigger, a magnitude four or five earthquake, for example. Uh, so Richter, a Richter magnitude of six would be 10 times more in ground vibration amplitude than a magnitude five earthquake, and a Richter magnitude of seven would be 100 times more ground motion at a given site. Mm -hmm. Uh, than that, but we've again taken out the distance decay curve, so yes. it would be general in that sense. And here for ground motion from uh, from 10 to a million, the Richter magnitude would go from 1 to 6. Okay. And the seismographs are well enough calibrated that you can get that dynamic range. Okay. So before that you couldn't, 
And so this is what a calibrated seismograph is capable of doing, getting the very small numbers for amplitudes and the bigger ones, until they clip. You know, once the yeah. pen gets too big, it can't go <laughs> much bigger than that. So what you were asking about, Sarah, mm -hmm. was in uh, intensity. Oh, OK. Intensity okay. So decays yeah. with distance. It does as okay. well. It, and that's the modified Mercalli intensity scale. Oh, okay. and that's so a that's a And that's a yeah. damage map. And that okay. predates Richter's magnitude scale. So oh. then, so Richter, the Richter scale then would be more just a measurement at the how at much the, energy was released. At, at well, this, and at and the, but you're right. measuring something at a calibrated seismogram, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you're taking the geology out by getting the reference the K curve with distance away from the epicenter. So you're trying to say something about the earthquake source. Okay. Okay. okay so if it, that makes sense. Yes. yes. And and but nowadays they do have the U.S. Geological Survey has a did you feel it website, yeah, and that is to yeah. make a Mercalli map of damage or how people felt earthquakes, mm -hmm. and that's not on a seismogram. But it's still very useful and valuable. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Awesome. Interesting. Yeah. Well, this is just a picture that if you wanted to compare with other forms of energy release, uh, again, I note here that uh, uh, Richter's earthquake may increases by one for an increase of 10 in seismic amplitude corrected for distance of the, of the calibrated seismogram. However, energy, it turns out, from an earthquake increases by a factor of 32 for each magnitude. And this is just, there's kind of a conversion between seismic amplitudes that the seismogram measures and a conversion for energy. And the reason why Gutenberg and Richter came up with this is they wanted to compare with other factors that have energy release. And this is kind of, there's like a lightning bolt, and I can't actually read on here all the things, but a yeah. big earthquake, a smaller earthquake. And on the left, it goes to the earthquake magnitude scale. And on the right is energy release oh, and uh, equivalent pounds of explosives. You know? and so you can compare with yeah. a nuclear bomb, you can compare with energy usage in the United States, or a big earthquake or a small earthquake, et cetera. And, and that's useful too. Yeah. So, 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 but this may confuse teachers and students because you'll sometimes see that factor of 32 for each magnitude increase, but it's still defined in the me measurement on the seismograph of a factor of 10 for each okay. increase in the magnitude, because that's how Richter defined it. Okay. Uh, well, there's also a powers of 10 scale for the numbers of earthquakes in a given region and where there are a lot more small magnitude earthquakes than larger magnitude. Of course, you have to have a defined magnitude scale to do this, mm -hmm. but it turns out in a given area of California, there'll be a lot more magnitude ones, twos, threes, maybe happening every day, every hour, and you may not even feel them, although the seismograph will. And uh, it turns out this also follow follows a powers of 10 logarithmic scale and is sometimes called the Gutenberg-Richter law. So Richter was also involved with this. And, but from this relation, you can go, say, here in the Midwest where we are, and uh, um, you could, say, count magnitude one or two earthquakes and make a graph of those and project on what might be the numbers of bigger earthquakes that might happen here, maybe over 10,000 years. And people do that. And it's sort of like we haven't recorded one. Well, we do record regularly magnitude fives in southern Indiana, for example, mm -hmm. every five to ten years. But then the question is, when would a magnitude six happen, and would it? And some people have projected here in, in the state we're in here at Purdue University that over the last 10,000 years on the Wabash Valley Fault Zone here in Indiana, there have been three magnitude sevens in 10,000 years. Oh. And so we haven't felt those here. In the geology, you could look at old rock deposits and make inferences that people have. Okay. But you could look at our recording of smaller earthquakes here and make some inference on that. And this is sometimes called the Gutenberg-Richter law. So it's another major, major powers of 10 in, uh, in um, study of earthquakes. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, the number of magnitude scales, there's lots of magnitude scales. And they come mm -hmm. down to that seismographs can measure P waves and S waves and, and surface waves. And you have different kinds of seismographs and different distance ranges that people use. And as a consequence, you'll see different kinds of magnitudes. And ML is, is traditionally viewed as the, the Richter local magnitude, kind of like what he okay. defined in Southern California. 
Okay. But then there are global magnitude scales that people use. There's something called MS and MB. And uh, because of this, they all have, they kind of, kind of measure different seismic wave amplitudes and different P wave versus other phases. Richter's magnitude scale was just the biggest thing on the record. And he just measured it with his ruler. Okay, and corrected for distance. I mean, that was that level. He printed it out on paper, on the drum recorder, the, the yeah. paper drum recorder. He measured it with a ruler. And then he factored that in for distance that it was from the earthquake epicenter, and then used that corrected one to compare different earths and say something about the source. You can do this with big earthquakes that are recorded all over the world, and those are slightly different magnitude scales. But this has led to kind of confusion with the press, and what they tend to do is they say, okay, the preliminary magnitude of an earthquake is this. Yes. And here in Indiana, we had this a while back, that something was initially uh, given a magnitude 5.1, and then it got reassessed by the U.S. Geological Survey as 4.7. Yeah. And the question is then, how do you go to the government and ask for money if it's a 5.1 versus a 4.7. So then you get into the politics of that one number, right? And if it's smaller, they may give you less money for you know repairing a bridge or something right. like that, right? Uh, but in recent years, they've tried to have magnitudes that are based on the size of the earthquake fault, meaning how big was the rupture on the fault, how much slip on the fault happened, and, and this led into something called the moment magnitude, which is now called MW. And it depends on the actual size of the earthquake fault and the slip on the fault. But really hidden in the background are these Richter type magnitudes measured on seismic mm -hmm. waves. But the idea was to get away and directly measure something on the epicenter of the yeah. fault itself. And some of them that are buried in the earth, how are you supposed to do that? Yeah. So it, hidden in it is the seismograph, the, 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 the seismograph, the Richter magnitude scale is still hidden in the background. And so, but. It kind of a, a caveat, you're trying to get an earthquake, and you're trying to get one number to quantify it. Mm -hmm. Earthquakes put out all kinds of, a symphony of sounds in the earth. And really to have one number do that is not the easiest to do. Yeah. And so for example, for earthquake engineers, and here at Purdue we've got world famous earthquake engineers here at Purdue. It depends on the on kind of the types of waves that would impinge on a bridge or earth or a building whether that building would have lots of damage or not. And so it actually goes past just the simplistic magnitude scale. So there are more numbers you may need, but still just saying how big was that earthquake is still useful. So that's why I say here, you know, to represent the size, there's still results in uncertainties in answering that question of just how big that earthquake was. So let me see if I've got, let's see what's after. This is just the example of one number might not be fully enough to characterize how a breakage of a big fault like the San Andreas breaks and how the seismic wave, what types of seismic waves come out and get recorded on your seismogram. Okay. Um, well, we can go to other numbers and take powers as well. And this is the, maybe the other most common one, which is a tooth scale. And instead of 10, 10, 100, 1,000, you can do numbers of two, in, in, and it's exactly the same. So you have some numbers on the left, and you can multiply the numbers of twos in there. So two is two, is two to the one, two times two is four is two to the two on the right hand with the, the exponent. Mm -hmm. And the logarithm of the power of the number two would then be similar to base 10, the number of twos that make up the number. Why would one want to use this number? Yeah, that would be my question. <laughs> well, computers, when they started getting developed after World War II, used these on and off switches, switches in there. And, it was, and they decided to write their numbers into zero or one. And they used a power of two scale. And on computers today, all computers work when they do addition and subtraction and multiplication in a power of two scale. Okay. Because every single tiny thing on the computer on your on your CPU uh, uh, does algebra in power of two. They'll write the number out in power, you know, in normal things that you and I yeah. can read. But the computer itself is working in powers of two. And and I think many of you may be familiar with this mm -hmm. because yeah. if you know some of that's called a bit. A bit is a zero one digit from yeah. a switching device on a computer circuit. 
And so nowadays calculations on computers are done in two, in, internally in base two, and but then they output the numbers and convert to a number you and I would normally be comfortable okay. reading. Mm -hmm. uh, but now they even this has kind of gone up to the size of your disk drive. So a byte is eight bits. A kilobyte is a thousand bits, technically a thousand twenty-four, because it's a power of two. Uh, a megabyte oh. would be a million bytes. A gigabyte would be a billion bytes. And so the prefixes, the kilo, mega, giga, are part of the so-called metric system. And it was a major simplification in the time of Napoleon for doing weights and measures is oh. to just have numbers that you have something like the meter or something and mm -hmm. you talk about a kilometer of a thousand meters you know uh, and uh, it, it now in sciences most people in science use the metric system mm -hmm. you know as opposed to the English system of inches and feet yeah. and miles etc mm -hmm. but still in the US we still use old English even though in England today they use the metric system. <laughs> they tried to they tried to save road signs from to put miles and and kilometers oh, on for distances, and it didn't work in the United States. It does in Canada. It doesn't work in the United States because we still like the English yeah. system. I didn't even know that. So, uh, uh, but this is where the power of two comes in. It's it's the number of twos that make up the size of your disk drive. And I think when I came to Purdue, like uh, like I think I had. You know, well, even now you have a flash drive in your pocket or yeah. something, mm -hmm. and it used to be a, a you know a, a megabyte flash drive was big, and Huge. now you get 32, and it's like 4.99 or something yeah. like that at Walmart. So uh, <laughs> yeah, and nowadays actually more. things come to gigabytes. Now the next one up from there is terabytes, yeah. and this is not uncommon for so-called big data. And so right now here at Purdue University, we're big on data science, and data science means big data. And terabytes are not small. So anyway, let's get back to baby again. And this gets back <laughs> to how babies count. And here, uh, uh, and here's a little girl baby. And she's looking at four little plastic lambs. And what they did with baby is they basically put electrodes on her brain and saw whether it lit up when they put four lambs versus five lambs. And it didn't make any dent. But if they did four lambs versus eight lambs, or eight lambs versus 16 lambs, she could tell the difference. And huh. this was apparently an innate skill of humans that they can sort of see small and medium and big mm -hmm. numbers of things, but not kind of these in-between numbers. And so in some regard, as I understand it, uh, and there could be you know people that know this better than I, uh, that uh, that babies, as they grow up, as they go through preschool and element, you know, and kindergarten, they start to lose that skill a bit because we teach them the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, yeah. nine, ten, mm -hmm. and that's not how their brain function. Their neurons in the brain really want to function. And the question is, do we change and keep where the baby wants to count, yeah. or do we change them to teach our way, which is the linear way? And uh, so, and this, remember, when we're talking powers of two, that gets back to that logarithm. It's the numbers of, say, factors of 10 or factors of two, mm -hmm. right? And it's just easier in your mind that you can even envision yourself if you had a bunch of things on a table. You can sell a lot versus not so much. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what the logarithm scale, the powers of 10 scale, does best. And this was just where I have a couple of things on the added resources page that people can hear. One of them called Why We Should Love Logarithms, and then How Babies Count. And so that people can certainly go and look and explore that. Mm -hmm. And this is certainly an important topic in, in, uh, in you know, biology and in psychology, yeah. et cetera, and in education as well. And uh, so here I just note an article that I happened to run across this in neuroscience research in, in a few years back, and that babies count logs, the logarithmic scale that is, and this means that newborn babies are able to notice an image of eight ducks on a screen as uh, 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 when they switch to 16. And so we notice they, they notice because the switch happens to the larger flock, and there's an observable spike in activity uh, in, the, in the lobe of the baby's brain. And so this isn't just babies noticing something has changed, 
a switch on the screen, you know, basically it could be trucks, it could be ducks, et cetera. And so they can identify the large increase in the quantity, but not a small one, say between eight and nine ducks or something on the mm -hmm. screen. And again, uh, this defines this innate sense, and that's why they sometimes call this innate counting sense of, of babies before they go into the educational system nowadays. And they relearn it back, say, in high school, where the logarithmic scale is, is more directly taught back again. And so, but it does, it is interesting, and ties, ties back with the title of how babies count yeah. Yeah. as well, and not just us stupid seismologists. <laughs> so, and Richter and all of us. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, and I think that's about it. Do you guys have any questions? I think it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think you did a really good job explaining that. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's it's just interesting. I mean, you hear of the Richter scale, but uh, find out a lot more about it is not. Well, he. Wa I mean, in, in the kind of the most simple sense, he really wanted a number between one and ten. Yeah. And, and the vibrations that the calibrated size we have for measuring which were much broader than that, to hundreds, to thousands, to really huge. And the seismograph needle could tell the difference. And so the question is, how do you get a number that gives you a simple, you know, one to ten number for the seismic? Yeah. Have we ever right. pegged this scale out on planet Earth? Yes. And Ooh. it turns out, and I, I'm not sure if I have this number exactly right, I should have brought this up, but I think a magnitude 11 or 12 would rupture the whole planet. Oh, oh my. So, so it goes logarithmically big enough that you suddenly get into massive amounts. Mm -hmm. And so, and I guess you could think of the fact that, you know, we, you know, humans have harnessed nuclear energy, right? Yeah. But uh, uh, we'd be hard pressed to blow the planet apart, you know, and even with our ability with nuclear energy and, mm -hmm. and you, know, you know, those type of things. But in the solar system, in the early part of the solar system, we did actually, we do have cases where asteroids in the asteroid belt get hit by something and broken apart. Yeah. And you can quantify that too. It's not necessarily the seismic waves in this sense, but the energy release and breaking apart or shattering a small asteroid. And it was thought in the early part of our solar system that a Mars-side object came and had a glancing blow on the Earth and the, the object actually disappeared and all of the debris from the Earth actually then got consolidated out into space to form our moon. Oh. And here at Purdue, we've got a big planetary science yes, group in this department, and there are active people in our department that study that first, you know, uh, 100,000 to a million years of the solar system when these things happen. Yeah. Yeah. But those would be things that, if you would ascribe it, an earthquake magnitude, would be at the 11, 12, 13 level. You know, okay. huge. Because it's expanding so much for each magnitude at that point. Yeah. You know, so there is a topped out limit. And I've never seen anything bigger than a mid nine. Than a yeah. mid nine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And the other one you can think of is the Tohoku earthquake that happened in Japan, and many people can remember that because that was the Fukushima nuclear yeah. disaster that that they had meltdown at this Fukushima power plant. Not primarily the earthquake because Japan had good earthquake awareness. It just happened that a large tsunami came and then overflowed their power generators mm -hmm. and knocked them offline. Mm -hmm. And then there was a meltdown in, in several of the nuclear reactors. And they're still off limits today. Oh, really? Yeah. So, I mean, they have remote robots that could go in, but not people. But in any case, that was, I believe, a 9.2 earthquake. Okay. A massive piece of ocean crust under Japan broke at the time. And uh, and uh, and the the most you know direct thing was this this Fukushima nuclear disaster. Mm -hmm. So uh, we fortunately here in Indiana do not have nuclear power plants, but our neighboring state of Illinois has a dozen. Okay. And we're within several hundred kilometers of there. And we're also currently, as we speak here, you know the the thing in Ukraine right now, and Chernobyl just got taken over by. That was at a big nuclear disaster 20 years ago, yes. and this yeah. was just taken over by the Russians. And they did take over the largest nuclear power plant in southern Ukraine, yeah, and they had some, you know, fighting, etc. Yeah. But those are not ones to mess around in terms of nuclear meltdowns, and neither happened at either power plant, as I understand it. 
but again, earthquakes can do that, and, the, and this is what happened during the, the, this Japanese magnitude 9.2 earthquake. Mm -hmm. So this is an interplay between natural phenomena in that case yes. and a, a major catastrophe. So uh, well, it's, I remember somebody's email tags saying that uh, nature bats last. Nature so, bats last. Well, I suppose uh, they do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, magnitude eight or nine earthquakes, you know, it depends when. Maybe, you know, every year we get a high magnitude seven, maybe an eight, you know, each year. But the nines are one up, and you're talking decadal mm -hmm. type of things when those happen around the entire world. So, and that gets back to that Gutenberg Richter number count. Yeah. There's a lot more smaller earthquakes than these big ones that only happen periodically. I didn't realize how many scales were involved. I did, yeah. yeah I did. And it was another power yeah. of 10 scale, and equally as important. So, I think that's it. Anything? Yeah, so, thank you. Very interesting. No, yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Science from the Experts from Purdue University Superheroes of Science. If you like this episode, subscribe, give us a positive view, and share the love. Boiler up! Hammer down!